Okay. Hi, welcome to week five. Um, we've got a bit of a fun week this week. Um, the lectures are pretty light. Uh, one of the benefits is that this first lecture on persistence is kind of um, a lot of, in fact, these lectures this week are all kind of relevant. The first three are relevant for your second iteration of your project, but they're not, uh, I guess, cr critical, you know, um, which is kind of nice because in a lot of ways, as we've talked before, the project is really, um, really these four lectures, you know, these are the four lectures that just really make up that project. So a little, <coughs> little bit of a load off this week. Um, tonight we will talk about iteration two. I have moved some lectures around. Uh, I may move some more lectures around. We will see how that goes, but it's mostly today just going to be talking about, um, you know, some stuff around, just trying to get this chat working. Lol, perfect. Yeah, just some stuff around the project, uh, both in terms of this persistence topic, which we start with, as well as iteration two, um, <coughs> which we will spend some time digging into. Sorry about the cough. So, <coughs> let's start with um, this topic, 5.1. It's not a very big topic, and the examples should be pretty straightforward. So, this is one of the full stack lectures, and this particular lecture is on the idea of persistence. And the reason for this lecture is that um, data is a really critical part of every software system that exists. So we want to understand the interactions between your software and stored data. Now you might think you were dealing with this a little bit in iteration one, but not quite. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about data as a concept. Then we'll talk about the persistence aspect of data and how that ties into the project. So firstly, fairly simple definitions. You might've seen these around before. Data as an idea, you might refer to as facts that can be recorded and have implicit meaning. Uh, raw data might be something you refer to a bunch. Data is often referred to as um, stuff without insight or information. So typically we will have data. You know, data could be a thermometer um, or a scale that you weigh yourself on or <coughs> a rain bucket that's measuring how much rain comes in. Um, but insight is essentially when you use that data to make decisions. Now, we're not really talking about that in this course. A lot of this course is really focused on just, well, the little bit we focus on in this course is really just focusing that data and how we use that data. Um, and in particular with software applications, right? This isn't about data like thermometers and stuff. This is actually about data that programs use and use to run. Uh, and most programs, and you would have seen this, they rely on data to work, right? They rely on variables, they rely on files on the hard drive, they rely on databases and everything else. Uh, and data is a huge topic broadly, though we just don't cover it much in this course. So most of the focus in this course is just on the interaction with data at an absolutely application level. So pretty much just to make software function. Not big data, not machine learning, um, <coughs> not data in the real world, not processing data, just really using data for applications. Now data in applications, uh, as I mentioned, is everywhere. However, when you'll hear data being referred to in a lot of software applications in the real world, they're often referring to something that we call the data layer. And the data layer is really just a part of software that's focused on storing and maintaining data for the long term. Most software applications have this kind of data layer. And again, these aren't universal terms, different projects, different organizations will refer to things differently. This is just a generalization. But what you will tend to find is that underneath all these uh, pieces of software, there is typically something that you might colloquially refer to as a database, right? database being a place that data is stored. Uh, you might have a program like your project where you have an interface layer, which might be your HTTP layer. Then you have some business logic, which might be, you know, your actual code that, you know, adds or removes users or channels or something like that. And depending on how big the piece of software is, you might kind of have functions and functions and things underneath it. But usually at the bottom of a lot of this stuff, you do have your data layer. Um, and again, this is a simplified diagram by, uh, you could draw you 10 of these. Sometimes you'd have a service layer separate to data that these could be all over the place, right? Um, and you've probably seen them like, you know, uh, AWS schematic diagram. You, you could see some systems like, you know, the system 
uh, we use at work at the moment called Elastic Beanstalk. And when you actually look at, you know, these things, they'll, they'll have diagrams that look like this, you know, and there is no right or wrong or blah, blah, blah. Um, but <clears throat> this one's very simple. You tend to have your interface, your kind of code that does the thinking, and then your data underneath. And that'll be the case for many, many of your simple university style software projects. Now, these data layers or databases are typically um, <coughs> uh, consist of something like, again, a database. And there are many different ways that we could store this information like a database. One of the main ways that we could store information is what you'd call in memory or in RAM. Um, and then another way is to store it in file, in a file, for instance, you know, if you want to store it in a text file or a JSON file or a CSV file. And then the third one is in some kind of relational database, uh, sorry, in, in a real database where you're actually storing it in a piece of software that's designed to store data. You have your, you know, relational databases like PostgreSQL, MySQL, MSSQL. You've got your um, NoSQL databases like your, um, you know, DynamoDBs and your MongoDBs and uh, things like that. And names aside, these are all just Firebase, if you've heard of that. These are all just different ways of storing data. Now, what's particularly important is that Typically, data layers are concerned with the persistence of data. And I think we have that on the next slide. Um, so we'll come back to that in a sec. But the persistence of data means data being stored kind of forever. Um, when you store data in RAM, in memory, that is when you don't actually store it on a hard drive on your computer. You, you store it really um, somewhere in the operating system's memory. So maybe it doesn't exist in your program's memory, but it exists in the operating system's memory. Often these kinds of methods of storing data are very easy to set up, very easy to maintain. The downside though is they're not persistent. And that just really means that if you pull the power plug out of a computer and the data's in memory or in RAM, it disappears, right? You, un you have an intuitive understanding of this. If your laptop dies, all the programs you had open, all the programs you were running, all the data they were storing as they were processing stuff all just vanishes. But everything you had on your file system or maybe running in a program that stores data, you know, properly, um, which are kind of the same thing, but let's treat them slightly differently. Um, it still exists because that data stays there. So as you move down this list from this kind of <coughs> temporary data that might disappear if you pull the plug on the power down to like a proper database, um, the barrier to entry becomes higher in terms of you need to do to set it, you need to do more to set it up and maintain it, but the performance and the reliability of these things gets much, much better. So, you know, if you are building a really simple application, you maybe just go with option one where you have memory that, you know, if, uh, the power gets shut off, that's okay. Cause your program can just restart and you can just add the data back in, um, uh, you know, simple video games on the internet are a bit like this, right? You're playing a game of Tetris. Imagine you make a game of Tetris for yourself on the computer or something, you know, you don't, you, in memory could mean variables as well, right? And in a lot of ways, all programs you write, the stuff you wrote in iteration one is just storing all the data in memory. If you think about your data store from iteration one, um, it, you wouldn't go so far as to say your program doesn't have a data layer because technically it did have a data layer. That was the data store file. It's more just that, um, like if we look up your project, right? And we go back to a previous commit, um, like this one here, you'll see that essentially when we look at your data store, wherever that is, source slash data store, this is kind of a data layer that was being used for iteration one. It's just that it was stored in memory because it was just kind of sitting there as the program ran. Um, and if the program finished or your computer kind of finished, then then that disappears. And there's a whole grayness to that whole topic too. But um, what we're going to be looking at in this course is more of the second one. And this is what this persistence lecture is about. Because once we start actually storing things on a hard drive, once we start storing things on a disk or in a file system, it kind of exists forever and persistently, which is a big thing. So um, that is why we are focusing a lot on this. Uh, we won't go any deeper into the in-database stuff. Uh, if you do want to learn more about relational SQL, you can always study Comp 3311. That's a course that is offered at CSE. It's totally up to you. Um, we've kind of covered some of these questions. 
which is around like, you know, how to application store data, variables and memory and stuff. And we've mentioned that that's all in memory. But what we're really interested in is this file system storage, options two and three, which is what we call persistent data storage. Persistence is a really important idea. Persistence is essentially just when a program state outlives the process that created it. It's a pretty simple concept when you think about it. You write a program, it stores some data in memory, the program finishes, that data still exists somewhere even though the program is finished. You know, this this is a fairly, um, you know, it's not the same as, but you probably come across this firstly when you did 1511 and they taught you how to do malloc and they were like, you know, if you malloc a variable, it allows the variable to exist beyond the end of the function that's called, right? It's just, it's all kind of similar ideas, except in this case, uh, it's outliving the process. So a computer is a bunch of programs running and those programs are just processes. Typically, <coughs> this is achieved by storing the state in the program. And, you know, the state could be variables or data or names or anything um, as data in computer data storage, right? Things like a hard drive and stuff. Persistence as a topic could be defined very broadly. If you want to get really deep into this topic, you could start saying that there are persistent ways to store data in memory because, you know, you could put it in like the operating system's memory again and then it could outlive the program and whatnot. But just to be really, really simple in this course, whilst we're really getting into this idea, we are just defining persistence as storing information on disk, storing data on disk. So if you have data in your program, you store it somewhere on the computer's hard drive or more specifically somewhere in the file system. You store your data in files alongside your program and therefore it lives on the file system even when your program finishes. That's kind of what we're going to be looking at together, right? Um, so the first question is, can we modify our project server to persistently store data and how would we do that? That's before we move on. Um, and we'll kind of, you know, do this little demo here together. So, um, and in fact, we might actually combine these two lectures together. Again, these are all new lectures in the course. This uh, next lecture is kind of a placeholder, actually. Um, so maybe we'll take the opportunity to talk a little bit about iteration two as well. We can kind of combine these two together. Um, if you're watching this recording later, there's a chance that this lecture page has been updated with like some recombined lectures. Because um, again, fleshed out lectures, things change. But let's actually take a look at... Um, no, let's... Um, before we get too deep into duration two, let's actually look at some of our servers from the previous week. So... Because you don't really need iteration 2 for this. You actually really just need a, a kind of express server to work with. So, did I just hit save? Oh, sh sh bugger. Um, okay, so let's find a server. What do we got? 4.2. We had a little CRUD server, right? That seemed to do some things. This is cute. This will this will do our job for us. Um, let's modify this a little bit and figure out how to make this work persistently and, here, and I'll show you what I mean right so let's imagine for a second now in reality your program might have a data store somewhere and in fact we could create that if we wanted to I'm going to make a file here in this folder called data store.js uh, and all it's going to do is in fact we could just copy what's in here let me just copy some of it right so there you go. We got some kind of get data and set data thing like this. Nice little file. Uh, next thing we're going to do is we're going to come over here. Maybe I should really move this over this side so you can see the code. Oops. Cool. Just going to make this bigger, easy. Okay. Make this smaller easy so um, <coughs> what we have here is if we want to use our own data store well I could just import it right I could say I want to import what's the get data I'm gonna you know import get data from data store like this great I've imported it I've got my little server here let's get rid of some of these routes and just keep things pretty simple to start off with um, we have our little get request here I'll call it you know get data 
let's say get users. It's a good example, right? Now inside my data store, let's have um, let's have a users key, which is just going to be an empty list to start with. Again, keep it pretty simple. Uh, and what this route will do is this route will say const data equals get data, and then I will simply return the JSON that includes users, which is just data dot users. So in theory, this little app that I have running here should return me an empty array. It should be return me a JSON object with an empty array. So let's go and try and run that npm run ts node on um, 4.2 crud, our previous example. 4.2 crud dot oops, source slash 4.2 crud. Now this should spool up the server, assuming I haven't done anything wrong. Hopefully. Oh, we got a bad export. What's that? Mm. I labeled the file dot js instead of .ts, right? So because I did .js, it was kind of really confused there because I my server file is a TypeScript file. So this is actually like a little bit of a heads up for those who've started Iteration 2. So in Iteration 2, we actually give you your server, which will be in TypeScript, and all your other files will be in JavaScript. So you'll actually need to go to all your other files and change them from .js to .ts. We'd love to do that automatically for you, but I don't think there's any really super easy way. So now I'm going to open up Chromium. All right, Chromium web browser, unlock. Uh, I'm going to go to my apps. I'm going to go to ARC, my favorite cute little tool. I'm going to open this back up, open ARC here, and then I'm going to go find my Apple route, which I know was just get Apple, and then I'm going to send it, and our server's running, and it's running on port 3000, I think. Oh, wait, let's check it out. So what do we got? Our uh, slash users, my bad, that's okay. So we'll go slash users, send 200 okay. Oh, okay, we got some weird thing back here. What's this? Users, how do I zoom in on this thing? Can I even zoom in on this thing? Is there like a way to zoom in? Preferences? That doesn't look too promising. Um, Okie dokie then. <laughs> how do I get rid of... <sighs> Uh, how do I close this? Oh, this is this is very sad. Maybe I'm grumpy now. Okay, there we go. Back to that. Sure. It says users, then it says bracket array zero or something like this, which is really, really weird. So let's inspect our code and figure out why we're getting something like that. Weird, what's data.users? Well, I can always console log it, right? If I'm not sure why something's happening with my server, I can just say console log data.users. And what did we learn last time, right? Do you remember last lecture? If you, if you haven't, go watch it, where we actually used nodemon. So what we did here was we said npm run nodemon instead of ts node, and that set up the thing where I could actually um, read, you know, if I write something like this, and I'm like, I want my server to restart, and I hit save, it will restart the server, and it will listen again. So that now I can just come back up here and click at it again. And because I put a console log in, it printed a console log here. Now, the fact that the console log is printing out an empty array, and the fact that the ARC here is printing out this whole array zero thing, makes me think that maybe it actually looks okay. And if I go here, it says, uh, this text here says toggle raw response view. I can actually see that the raw response is what I expect. So it's actually okay. This was just me worrying about something that's like, you know, not a problem. That's okay. So come back here. Okay, so I'm getting those users. Now, let's say we have another route, which is going to be a post route because we're going to be creating something, um, which we'll call like add user or like user slash add and we'll make it a post request because remember posting is about creating. And in this case, what we do is we go and get our data and then now in reality you don't really have to set the data this came up on the forum a few times it's okay it doesn't matter however you've been doing it's perfect because it just doesn't really matter um, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say that um, data.users.push and then I need to push something well how do we get information passed in on a post request is through request dot body um, dot and then the something which in this case might be name so, uh, you know, new name equals request.body.name like this. And then I say to my users array that I'm going to push to it. And because this doesn't need to return anything, I might just have it return uh, an empty object like that, you know, blank object. 
great i hit save it refreshed and all of that uh, i got some errors here it says new name is oh that's just me naming things wrong again because node bonds running it just automatically restarted that for me so now i can load this up this route's still working now i'll go and add another route which is users slash add and i make this one a post request uh, and then in the body here i add uh, was it uh, name was it name check my code yes it was name and it was just user slash add that's bad thing i should probably just call actually that's fine ah let's make it users to be consistent um so here i say name is just going to be hayden and now what happens is that my you got to think about it my server's running it's just running forever except when i save it and then it restarts but ever, since the last save it's running and i hit send and it says 200 okay i get my little empty object i go back and i call the other route to get it and now it says there's something in the array i don't know why it's displaying it so weird but what it's putting in the array is null and if i go and try and add another name if i click this request a few more times and i go back to my users one you'll see that it's actually got four nulls in there so what's actually happening here is really interesting firstly <coughs> the server because it's a program that runs kind of forever until you tell it to not to, it's actually kind of storing this information. You wouldn't say it's persistent though because the process is always running, the server's still running. So the data is living within that lifetime of the process. But, um, and, and you can see that because if I restart the process just by hitting save here and I go back to my get request um, and I hit send, everything's gone so the data did not persist and that's because the data was being stored whilst it was kind of being stored in something that you might call a database or a data layer which it kind of is if you think about it maybe it depends on your definitions of it it's not persistent um, and we can see that as we add things to this that uh, the adding part isn't working so if you're trying to add something to it and it's not working first thing you do is you go and debug it right you come back here and you start console logging things. So I might do a couple of things. I might console log request.body.name. I might also console log request.body and we can just see how these two things pan out. I wait for the server to restart. I add something um, and I can see here that it got undefined. It's like, oh, okay, that's not good. So why is that undefined? Well, what did we find out last time? We found out last time that as we pass things in, we needed to make sure that the app.use was correct so that we we're actually putting in the correct thing here for JSON. Um, so it's a post request. You can tell it's working, that it's going to the right type, get or post, and that it's going to the right URL because we're actually getting that console log. But it's quite interesting here that you can see that the body is again an empty object. Now we've come across this before. I'm not sure if anyone can tell me what's going wrong here. Um, Anyone know the answer? See if anyone can figure it out really quickly. It's a bit of a finicky thing, but you know, that's okay. Um, give you all like another, again, I know there's a bit of, bit of lag, but let's see how we go. Beep, 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 beep. It's okay. We'll just keep going. If anyone gets it right after the fact, good on you. Uh, probably the main issue here is the fact that everything we're sending is not uh, JSON and therefore it's kind of being ignored. So typically when you send a body, you want to send it as JSON and usually that will help. Oh, application slash JavaScript, my bad. Um, application slash JSON. Yeah, so you can see that now that it's being sent as JSON, the server knows what to look for. Because previously when we told the server that you're accepting JSON, what happens is if it doesn't get JSON, it just kind of ignores it, like it kind of filters it out. Whereas now because the request is saying that, hey, here is the JSON, it's kind of like, you know, matching. It's just, you know, two things matching together. So now we actually get that data and you'll see if I click this, you know, three or four times and now I go back to my get route, I actually have those five names there for Hayden. And if I come back to post and I change one of those names to Sally and I click Sally twice, and then I come back here and I do the get again, you'll see that Sally comes up twice. So this is, you can kind of start to see how your iteration one work, your foundational work starts to come into play here because 
when you're making a server like this, because this server is just kind of running forever, as opposed to your C style program that you just run and it's finished, um, it actually does things. So this is all good, but again, we still have the problem where when we restart the server, when we stop it and start it again, everything is gone. So what are some ideas? Someone give me some ideas of how you would store this data. How would you store this data? If I told you it needs to be persistent. <coughs> give me some ideas. Because all the data is gone again, which isn't very fun. It's very sad, in fact. Very problematic. I have some ideas, of course. Theo says, could you change servers, therefore leaving the data on its OG server? I don't quite know what that means. Could you change servers, therefore leaving the data on its OG server? I, I You'd have to explain that slightly more for me to fully get it. Um, um, Mridul says, Mridul, if I'm saying that okay, um, as well as James say to store it in a data store.json file. Um, Theo says to move from one port to another. Um, if you move from one port to another, that would be fine, but the issue we're kind of dealing with is that as soon as the process ends, as soon as we kind of control C the program, the data ceases to exist because the data was just stored in a variable. So there's one way around this, right? There's a couple ways. Firstly, let's imagine that we, let's make a new route and we'll call that route save. Slash save. And what save is going to do is save is quite literally just going to go and get the data and it is going to write it to a file. Now, what do we remember about writing to a file? We can do file system dot uh, write file sync, which takes in, oh, I can't remember what it takes in. I think it takes in a file name, such as like source slash data dot JSON, and then it takes in a data, and then I think it takes in like a flag is right or something. I should Google that. Um, I have to import file system, right? That's another thing. So I have to import fs from fs. Um, that's actually this is one of the other benefits of TypeScript is TypeScript will usually tell me if you got it, TypeScript will tell you if you got it wrong. In this case it looks like it's okay. But if for instance if I got these two things swapped around, TypeScript will usually be pretty vocal. It's one of the one of the really benefit big benefits of static verification here is I, I, I immediately know I've done something wrong. So well, we can swap those back around. So now we've got that. So we can try this out. The server is going to restart here. Now obviously I'm just trying to write hi to this file. Now this file needs to say source slash data dot JSON because I'm running the program from the env2 folder here. Even though like, even though my file here is, is in the source folder, because I'm running the file from the parent folder, I need to include that as well. So what we can do here is we can add another post route and this particular post route here, uh, which is just save, if we run that, you'll see that I got an empty, you know, object, which makes sense because that's what my route returned. But now we can see if there was a file created for us called data.json, it was. And I can see in that file is high. So now I have the cool idea, there's the file, of instead of high, why don't we json dot stringify the data so we'll stringify the data and then we'll store that in a file that's a cool idea so now what happens is that if i have a program which you can see has no users in it and then i want to go and add three sallies i'm going to click that three times you see i've got three sallies here and now i'm going to go and save that data to the file and now i can see inside of data.json i have their users sally 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 and when my program ends and I restart it again, the program itself won't have that data anymore, right? It's empty, but the data's in a file. And that's useful for me because I can go and take that file and I can go and load information from that file now. So I can actually come up and say, well, you know what, server, when you start, right, um, the very first thing I'm going to ask you to do, right down here, is, 
Or you could do this before you start, really. Doesn't really matter. I could do this just above my app.listen here. I could say, well, I would actually like you to go and uh, read from a file, which is source slash data.json with flag r. And I want you to read the data from, uh, or you know, stored data from that file. And I would like you to set the data to be that stored data. You can see set data here has given me a type. It's complaining. It's saying it's complaining because I didn't import anything. Now that I import that, it should be more relaxed. So now what's happening is when my server loads, it's actually going to try and get the data from the file and then set the data. Now what's the problem here? Has anyone noticed the problem here? There's an obvious problem here. It's a common mistake that you might make. It's really easy to make. Someone's probably noticed it already. Um, so, 10 points for anyone who picks up on it. Give you five more seconds before I just go through it. Um, but the problem here, and I'll just save you the pain, <coughs> or maybe I'll show you the error. Let's see what happens when I try and when I try and get something. So I click get here, and I get an empty empty object, and it's like, okay, that's not good. And in fact, it's undefined when I try and look at it. Um, and a big part of what's gone wrong here is that the stored data in a file is actually a string, uh, whereas the data I want to load into set data needs to be parsed. So I need to kind of decode the JSON into something um, a bit clearer. And I can see here that I also need to cast it to a string. And this is like a TypeScript thing because what comes from a file is a buffer uh, and TypeScript wants a string. So now we should see that when my server loads here, um, it actually has that. So this is actually really cool because now I can stop my server and I can run my server and the data will still exist there, right? The data will be um, in the file still, which is really great. So that's super useful. And this is essentially what we mean by the persistence of data. So this data now outlives the length of the program. So if the program stops and it starts again, the data is still there. And this is the kind of thing that we ask you to do for your second iteration. Now, the reason we ask you to do it is not because we're mean, because this is actually pretty easy. In fact, the concepts I've shown you today are really just combining a few ideas, which is, you know, writing to a file in JSON, which was one lecture back in week three, and then using an HTTP server, which we did in week four. Uh, but it makes debugging your work substantially easier. Now, here's the interesting question. What I'm not going to show you today is probably a better way of adding persistence to your project because in your project you can't rely on the say on having a save route that someone's just going to apparently call at a time that's convenient. The what you need to do for the project is basically one of two things. One is either set up some kind of timer where a timer will run on your server and every one second or something it will um It'll go and save all the, the file, all the data to a file. Or the more, more common way that people are likely to solve this problem is by actually adding a, like a save function to the end of every route so that just before or just after the response returns data, your route, every one of your routes actually saves the most recent data itself. Now, both of these methods are not really what you would call industrial methods. They are not something that you would use at scale in industry by any stretch but they are both things that work perfectly fine for the Comp1531 project, which is really, really useful. So um, definitely try and do one of those. If you're a really, really ambitious group, like a really ambitious group, you could actually go and have a look at what we did with higher order components um, back in week four, at the start of week four. There's actually some ways that either through higher order components or if you want, you can have a look at defining your own express middleware. These are two kind of very more serious ways of saving data after every route. Uh, that's only for the really keen bean groups. And if, if anything, you might want to save that for iteration three as a bit of a bonus mark if, or something like that. So, because uh, I think we have bonus marks in iteration three, but I guess nothing stops you doing it now and just saying it was a bonus mark later. So, sure. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways that you can solve this particular problem. Um, this is not one of them, but it gives you all of the code and the baseline that you need to actually do that. So yeah, a lot of fun, pretty simple topic. Um, 
adding persistence to the project. I've already mentioned that you can store it in a single file. I've kind of taken you through this, right? This is um, everything I've just said. This is more just for your reference later on in the notes. And that's actually the end of this particular lecture. So if you want to leave some feedback on this, that would be great. But before we wrap up, just want to make sure there's, is there any other kind of lingering questions about the topic as persistence? Um, Kavan says, write JSON to a text file. Yeah, um, yeah, you can uh, write to a text file. File extensions are meaningless. Well, they're not meaningless, but they, they, don't, they don't mean anything. You could just write JSON to a file called data.txt. You could write text to a file called data.json. The computer doesn't really, particularly for programmers, doesn't really care about the difference. Um, so, you know, that's, that's totally up to you, really. Uh, but that's pretty much it again on persistence. It's definitely something you want to look at for your iteration too. It's not difficult. It's just very helpful. And the reason it's helpful is because what it allows you to do is to kind of debug a bit more comfortably. Because something that you'll find a bit easier in iteration two compared to iteration one is because you have the server that's running all the time, you can kind of play with it without having to write tests. And therefore, you'll feel like it's a bit more natural to play, to, you know, to poke with. Um, and yeah, so you'll, you'll just kind of find that more useful because you can like register a user and log in as a user and add a channel and do some other things like that. So, um, I'm not sure how we're going to go for time tonight. We might actually be able to plow through some extra lectures. So let's actually take a five minute break now, start up at 6.59 and keep going.